Good morning, and for those who haven't had the pleasure of meeting before, my name is Anne Bell. I'm the University Librarian here at the University of Sydney. Before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship country. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to the first Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Knowledge Seminar Series. This is being run by the University Library in conjunction with the Office of the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Indigenous Strategy and Services. It's the first in what's going to be the series of six talks this year, which will be held on a stage basis. And part of the background to this is that the University Library was extremely privileged to have six staff participate in the University's Culturally Competent Leadership Programme last year. That group of six staff have gone on to form a cultural competence community of practice in the library and are proud to be presenting this series of seminars. Each seminar will be presented by experts on a variety of subject areas and future events in the series will focus on philosophy, connection to country, visual art, medicine and perspectives on gender. Underlying all of these, the theme of knowledge sharing is an important concept in libraries given our role is to provide access to information. So in the seminar series, we get to investigate the role others play in sharing knowledge, whether it be through embedding it into school curriculums or how an item is displayed in a museum. And today, this seminar focuses on history and language and it is now my pleasure to give you a brief introduction to our speakers. Matt Cole is the Assistant Curator of the McLean Museum Indigenous Heritage Collections, as well as being the University of Sydney's Repatriation Project Officer. In Matt's 2016 exhibition and publication, Written in Stone, he explored historic Aboriginal stone tool collections and considered how these collections have transformed into contemporary consultation tools about Australia's past. Matt is currently working with the new University Museum's Indigenous Consultation Project in order to facilitate Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island community perspectives into the design of a series of permanent and temporary exhibition spaces within the new Chowchuk Wing Museum project, which is due to open here at the University of Sydney in 2020. Our second speaker is Professor Jacqueline Troy. Professor Troy is an Aboriginal woman from the Snowy Mountains of New South Wales and director of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research at the University of Sydney. Her research and academic interests focus on language, is particularly endangered Aboriginal and contact languages, also language education, linguistics, anthropology and visual arts. She has extensive experience developing curriculum for Australian schools, focusing on Australian language programs. Professor Troy is also Editor-in-Chief of Ab Original, Journal of Indigenous Studies and First Nations and First Peoples Cultures. Both speakers have kindly agreed to have um, their session followed by a Q&A, so please do build up your questions for each of our speakers. And it is now my great pleasure to invite Matt Paul to take the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming across today. Um, I'm incredibly fortunate to be working with the McLean Museum and actually being working with the museums at this really incredible moment when we're transitioning from a very 19th century museology into a very 21st century museum which we're proposing to build. You actually can see the hoardings that have gone up around the corner of um, on Broadway there. Um, so the new Chow Chuck Wing Museum, of course, is a really interesting philosophy because we have the amazing university art collection, we have the Nicholson Museum, which is a lot of classical antiquities from Greece, Rome, Egypt, but we also have 
the Clay Museum, really fasc fascinating natural history collections and cultural anthropology collections which I work with. And the challenge of working in a 21st century museum is how do we actually put these cultures, these time periods, these histories in dialogue with each other in ways that are really receptive to 21st century audiences. So telling the story of the Aboriginal history of Sydney, of the pre-contact Aboriginal history of Sydney and the post-contact social and political history is a really important challenge. Um, even on a very basic level, you know, asking this question, what is an acknowledgement of country? How do we acknowledge that this is Gadigal land? You know, the Gadigal being one of seven language groups across the greater Sydney region. Um, even interrogating the word, you know, it's fantastic to have the resources of a university at our disposal as we're researching and uh, looking into the history of the site and the place where we're assembled here today. So by some accounts, the word Gadigal is a word for xantheria, for the grass tree. Um, it was a very multi-purpose um, resource. The long stem that grows was used for making fishing spears. Um, the leaves were woven and uh, turned into basketry, string making. Um, there's even a type of resin which is produced at the bottom of the xantheria tree, which is a type of plastic for all intents and purposes. It can be heated affixed to uh, fishing spears, it's waterproof, you can mold it, um, reheat it again and use it again. It's a very sustainable technology. So even through just exploring um, the, the history of the word Gadigal, we're actually opening up all these really incredible tangents of research and exploring new ways of how do we actually embed this idea of country into the architecture of the building, into the landscape design, into the whole space where our university is situated here because it's really about incorporating what the community have told us about wanting um, their, space, their history and their space to be acknowledged on their own terms. So even if we have these fantastic resources, it's still incredibly community driven and the whole philosophy with all of the regions that will be represented in the new museum is to actually embed community perspectives on these objects and on these histories into the ways that they're exhibited. It sounds a bit lazy as a curator, you know, handing over all the choices and decisions to um, a community focused um, consultation sort of idea. But in the long run, it actually allows us to sort of step back from some of the unethical histories associated with these objects and the caricatures and the just the different versions of histories that can be associated with them and try and tell them in you know, really interesting new ways, try and create really new narratives for the 21st century. Um, even when you go through the historical record of understanding the history of place and what's out there. Um, so that foundational moment, um, April 28th, 2020, when Cook landed in Botany Bay, um, he acquired 50 fishing spears off the beach that day. You know, these were a resource made from Xantharia stems, more than likely. Um, there's only three or four that are still known of in existence today. A lot of them got broken up and distributed into private collections. Um, but also, this is another piece of um, rope from the Sydney region acquired a little bit later. If we can, in some way, reinvigorate some of these material cultural practices, uh, fishing technologies, string making, um, all the different sort of craftsmanship that goes into things like even stone tool production. We can act to go a little, a long way into actual helping the descendants of all the um, Sydney Aboriginal communities um, reclaim and revitalise these really amazing knowledges. I mean, from some of our archaeology sites, we know that Aboriginal people have been living in the Sydney region for 11,000 years. There's a site on the Hawkesbury River. Um, now just to get your head around that space of 11,000 years is enough, but you know, men, women and children sustainably surviving in all the different landscapes that we walk past every day. There's so much Aboriginal history still choked under the surface there that if we can just find new ways to ethically engage with community and bring these stories to the surface, um, we can go a long way in actually rectifying those mistakes of the past where there was these non-Indigenous authored versions of Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal history which still sit out there and still can sometimes misinform community members today. So it's an ongoing project to really interrogate a lot of these historical sources and the motivations for the creation of those source materials.
not to mention the really different versions of history that you hear as well. So the, the Xantharia resin that I mentioned, it's also a perfect example of an Aboriginal medicinal property. There's medicinal knowledge that's embedded in the use of the Xantharia resin in the resin. Um, so this, when the first fleet arrived, for example, in the diary accounts of the surgeons that travelled with them, they talked about how they were given um, resin for the dysentery that they were suffering after being on the, joke, on the, the, the journey for so long, um, because that's what it does. It's the same as tea tree oil, which is a locally sourced antiseptic. Um, you know, there's, a, there's medicinal properties in these resins which help with upset stomachs. You know, there's all these medicinal knowledges and um, really incredible knowledges that in, we have some accounts of Aboriginal people freely sharing them with the first people who were first settlers who arrived here. But you know, history has shown that that relationship was very quickly um, the power balance became incredibly distorted, um, and for a number of reasons, all these incredible histories, right at those fulcrum moments of pre-contact and post-contact history, we're just not telling them well. Um, I think there's a you know there's a lot of work to be done of really exploring that those the first five, first ten, first fifteen years of the colony here in Sydney because you know not only do we not tell indigenous history well I don't think we really tell colonial or conflict history that well either. So it's all tied in together in some, in some ways. So yeah, trying to get a sense of the space where we are here and you hit all these roadblocks really quickly straight away. So um, from those same accounts that I was talking about with the, you know, the knowledge, the, the references to medicinal properties, um, we get an idea that this space that we're assembled on here is called the Kangaroo Ground. Um, before it was Grouse Hill Farm, um, before it became the University of Sydney in 1850. So as a space we have a, with a hilltop, um, you know, Blackwattle Bay, where the fish markets, markets are, there used to be streams that went all the way through to Victoria Park here. There was actually a bridge on Parramatta Road at one stage. This has all been infilled and reshaped this landscape that we walk across today. Um, it's a really difficult job actually trying to conceptualise just the way the landscape has changed so much. Um, but being a kangaroo ground and associated with potentially the fire stick farming where you burn, to do, burn in particular patterns to attract animals into other areas where it's easier to hunt them. That's one of the earliest associations in the early convict and colonial accounts of this particular space. But calling it the kangaroo ground is also um, complex because the word kangaroo was acquired by Lieutenant Cook in 1770 and it was brought from um, around the Cooktown region in North Queensland and then it was brought back as a word list in 1788. So the Darug and the Gadigal and the, you know, all the Eora peoples of Sydney, they didn't call it a kangaroo, they called it Badigarang. So when, you know, there's these deeper histories and associated in the words and how loaded they are when the first fleet at this word list that um, they brought, that Philip had been given, compiled from Cook's notes. Um, you know, they still had this idea of this pan-Aboriginal language across the mainland. Um, you know, there was when they said kangaroo to the Sydney Aboriginal people, it would have been a nonsensical word, quite like, literally. Um, so, do we actually call it the Patagaran ground, not the kangaroo ground? You know, there's really interesting discussions and um, challenges about how we have recorded history and how we have actually stamped names on these places and overwritten the entire um, Gadigal you know, taxonomy, all their word lists, all their knowledges, there's some amazing examples that we can see. Um, not to mention, you know, people just don't realise how incredible Sydney is. We actually, in Kuringai National Park, is one of the largest outdoor rock engraving galleries and anywhere on the east coast of Australia. It's only rivaled by the ones on the Burrup Peninsula on the, on the western Australian coast. So here in Sydney we have this um, incredible um, artistic history spanning back thousands of years as well. We know of at least 1500 sites in the Kuringai National Park and there's plenty of other places in Sydney when you find them too. Um, and within any of these sites you can have up to a hundred with engravings within those sites. So we're talking thousands of images 
associated with all sorts of things. It's a huge storybook of the Aboriginal pre-contact history of Sydney that sadly, because of the lack of resources, the best way to preserve this is to let it overgrow and wait till someone in the future can bring the proper resources to actually um, you know, work with this site and document it and record it. There's been a lot of different versions and you know, there's an amazing work done by the National Parks and Wildlife Officers with the very limited resources they have. But we don't actually study this. We don't have that um, ability yet to um, support the local community representatives in doing it the way that they want to do it, instead of some heavy-handed, you know, state government sort of way. Yet, not even to think about trying to think about what these mean aesthetically, or what they actually, what the stories that are embedded in them. Um, these are mostly ones from the coastal area around Bondi, and it's from Port Hacking up in the top corner there. And so that's one actually one of the ideas that we're talking to community about at the moment is, is one option to maybe reinterpret the aesthetics of the Sydney rock engravings into some sort of um, motif which we can use to represent Sydney Aboriginal culture in our museum. You know, it might be as part of an acknowledgement of country in the foyer or it might be associated with the logo of the museum. You know, there's no shortage of amazing options. Um, other artists have done several, mostly working with the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. Um, this is one from the Royal Botanic Gardens. You'll see great examples, especially recently in Barangaroo and different places as well. The City of Sydney actually has an entire plan called They're Building a Monument to the Eora, which has been a really drawn out process because they didn't want to limit the artist with having to work with a particular site. They wanted to leave it really open as much as possible so that the artist picked a site and then worked from the, the knowledges that they could find there. Um, but this, those discussions that go places, it's not a matter of us going out and taking a photo of the rock outside that we like and then using it for ourselves. You know, it's part of the whole process involves building a relationship with the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, finding the people who are the liaisons with the National Parks Offices, supporting them in what they need before we start sort of asking for things which we need. You know, this is part of the cultural reclamation project which we do as museums. It's um, always trying to assist existing opportunities rather than build entirely new ones from scratch, which I think has happened a lot too. And then the potential for how these can actually be applied into what we're doing is just endless. Um, so in Barangaroo, after their consultants, they picked a, a number of um, motifs that they thought were quite interesting, distributed through them. There's a, they're quite hard to find, actually. I think this, the project was ambitions were bigger than the, the budget that they had. But when you find these locations where the rock engravings are, um, you can wave your app over them and it tells you a deeper story of that place, which is something that we're really trying to do as well. I mean, you don't want to have text labels all over those objects and you don't want to read an essay every time you're experiencing something aesthetically. So that balance between information and presentation um, is really interesting in, in, when you're working in an Indigenous arts context because the interpretations of that are changing you know, really constantly and in really interesting ways. <clears throat> but all the other different layers as well. So you know, even though we are in our research project entirely focused on representing an indigenous sense of place in the, in, the, in the story of Sydney, in the history of Sydney, in the place where we are gathered now. You can't um, underestimate um, where other sources of information are going to come from. So in our consultations with Metro Land Council, he pointed us to the story that they knew of, an, of a Gadigal man who worked as a groundskeeper on the Grouse Farm estate. Um, it was quite notorious for capturing escaped convicts. You know, there's these deeper stories of radical people that are entirely there, and it's not good enough to say that, oh, yeah, it's, we didn't come across it, or, you know, there's just no excuse for not finding these histories. This is where we are at a site like the University of Sydney, and we have such an obligation to at least tell the, our own story of place, you know, with all the best available tools and information that we have. This is looking back. Um, Cooper's Distillery, so I think that's down from around Wentworth Park, looking back towards the university. Um, 
And this actually is really interesting because it came up. Um, so we recently did a forum about all these lost collections of Aboriginal stone tools, which are sitting in people's sheds and garages all around the state. Um, you know, and when we actually looked at it separately, we realised the biggest collectors of stone tools in New South Wales are farmers. You know, we're talking to all these other sort of people who have no expertise in, in what stone tools are and where they're found and how you come across them in your day to day work and stuff. So it was this real challenge to try and, okay, how do we start a new conversation with the farming community about what to do with these boxes and boxes of really important stone tools um, which are distributed in private collections all around the, um, all around the state. Um, and it's, it's how we sort of work with these heritage, which in some ways are becoming obsolete. I mean, stone tools have no real use value other than their educational purpose these days. But um, when we find new ways to talk about them and use them as consultation tools to talk to communities who we don't have images of, or we don't have objects from, or we don't have, you know, there, there's objects missing because they're in museums overseas, or they were destroyed or sold to private collectors. It's a, it's a really, the different layers um, is something that you really can't ignore. So, um, you know, telling the Gadigal story of the, of the, the Gadigal groundskeeper who's associated with the farm, so it gives you a different perspective on, you know, just the European farm. <laughs> it's just what the gross farm representations normally show. Not to mention just the amazing discoveries that you find. So we actually do have a stone axe from um, Victoria Park here, which was found when they were creating Lake Northam. Um, it's, of course, it's held in the British Museum, where all the great things from Sydney are held. Um, we, the, one of the most difficult things for the Sydney Aboriginal community in the 21st century is that during the 19th, so much of the East Coast assemblage is held by museums in Britain and Paris and Switzerland and Chicago. There's actually more East Coast Australian heritage in international museums than there is in local. And that's the real challenge for us because it's not even a matter of just repatriating everything and giving it back. It's, it needs to be... Um, we need to apply all these new ways of thinking about these ob objects and unpacking what they mean. Um, you know, Bruce Pascoe is, is a great example of that. When he researched the agricultures and grindstones, he found how common kangaroo grass seed was. Now he's commercialising that. He's taking a, a, a knowledge which was found in a museum object and he's commercially producing kangaroo grass seed flour, which, and, you know, it, it, he can't keep up with supply. So, you know, there are these ethical ways we can actually unlock indigenous knowledges which are embedded in research and, and you know, economically empower Aboriginal people to actually use that information as well. So, it may not look like much, but this, we don't know whether this is the type of axe that was used um, for hunting a specific type of animal, whether it was only used in, um, you know, cutting shields off a tree, as a whole network of information associated just with this single axe which has sat in the British Museum since 1923. The, we tracked down a lot of these actually because the University of Sydney, um, especially the staff of the Nicholson Museum, used to build these assemblages of Aboriginal stone tool kits and send them to museums all around the world and swap them with other objects. So a lot of the histories of the objects that we have in the Nicholson Museum is because we swapped a stone tool assemblage from Australia for that object with a museum curator overseas. So, you know, just the trade networks of stone axes within Australia is fascinating enough until you add this other layer on top of it of the trade networks of stone tool assemblages around museums all around the world. And you start down this rabbit hole of like, you know, endless, really interesting stories and data and, you know, where people were finding things and the relationships between the Aboriginal people who um, sometimes were wanting to give these things to collectors because they knew they were going into museums and into this bigger network. And, you know, some of the great work that uh, Jackie and I think our other speakers today will go into too is about how we can interrogate even the earliest word lists um, of the different languages of the Sydney region. Um, so there's a great project we're sort of thinking about at the moment. So we have the university's motto, which is um, the stars change, the mind remains the same. 
Um, and we do this all the time in our um, natural history collections, for example. So we have a, a Latin name for a bird or a reptile or a species of fish. Um, but if we can attach a Latin scientific name to this object, there's absolutely no reason we can't attach a Darug language word to this object as well. Um, all of our native species and animals and plants that we hold in our collections, you know, we're trying to treat language as an object in itself and actually reattach all that information, you know, so that we can look at a collection and, and name it in the way that a Darug person or a Gadigal person or a Wiradjuri person would have known that that same animal. Um, and we can do the same with the university logo, for example. So it's not about replacing or finding better ways of doing things, it's just um, interrogating what we've already got. Um, even working in the museums myself, um, you know, we have the Nicholson, the University Art Collection, archives up on level nine, rare books, you know, not to mention all the wealth of information and all the PhDs which are produced across all the faculties. In some ways you have too much information, we need to find better ways of actually, you know, really linking it together so that it's actually useful, especially for Indigenous community members who want to access our collections because there's no shortage of really great examples where sometimes in a lot of our collection, it's sometimes the only objects that people have from that particular region or from that particular time period. You know, it's a real responsibility to make sure that you know, someone in a couple of hundred years time can come and visit that same object in exactly the same context that their ancestors saw it. <clears throat> so yeah, Jackie will probably do more. Um, but there's other interesting things that we're pulling out of these lists as well. So when you look at um, one of Patagarang's who worked with Lieutenant Dawes, she, they worked to get the gill out in whatever way you can think of that. Um, I produced around 2,000 words from the Sydney region. This is all prior to 1791. Um, Dawes was the um, astronomer who came with the first fleet. Um, but I really found it interesting that there's actually six directions for wind in the Sydney language. And that goes to this idea of decolonizing these ideas too. You know, the cardinal compass of north, east, south, west was imposed in 1788. There was actually local ideas of wind direction, you know, there was a directionality which had nothing to do with what we consider the, you know, the northeast, southwest. Um, the same with the seasonal calendar, it took a lot of people a while to realise that the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere had these different, especially in an agricultural context. And um, when you really interrogate Patagarang's word list, you find some of the most fascinating examples of knowledges. So, um, so Patagrain was around 1516 by some accounts and two of the words that she supplied is Kalgalion and Pudinon, which are these two um, clusters, I guess I'm not an astronomer, <laughs> um, that sit off the Milky Way. Um, so here's a teenage girl with a very sophisticated knowledge of something in the night sky which is incredibly obscure even to me with all the access that I've had to astronomical knowledges in my lifetime. Um, you know, what, there was the story associated with these two clusters as well and the way that they followed the Milky Way. You know, there, there's this, um, we just don't see enough of how sophisticated Aboriginal knowledges were. Um, in the, especially in the Sydney region, you know, we're great at projecting it into other parts of the country and looking for it there, but there's no shortage of really amazing evidence of these, you know, amazing, you know, linguistic or astronomical or medicinal or just general historical knowledges. All we've started with here is words and stone tools, basically. <laughs> so, you know, once we actually start moving into much more complex assemblages, who knows how many more better cultural revitalization projects we could be doing. Um, <laughs> this is another great example, some fantastic work by Ray Norris and Dwayne Humacker, um, CSIRO. Um, so one of the sites in uh, the Karingai National Park, for example, is at the Elviana Track site, which is completely open to the public, one that the people are encouraged to visit, so if you get a chance, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, Every September, or the start of spring, um, the EMU pattern here perfectly aligns with the, the negative space inside the Milky Way. We 
which is associated with all these emu stories, all the way through Western New South Wales, South Australia, it's a songline story. In its safest context, um, it's about men and teenagers' initiation ceremonies, because it's male emus that look after the eggs. So there's actually an egg inside the rock engraving there. And the other interesting thing is that when it aligns up, that's the time of year when emus, which used to be all around Sydney here, the first emu ever hunted and captured was captured in Redfern in 1791. Took a few years to get one. But um, in the Karingai National Park region, that's the top, um, when this lines up perfectly. That's when the, this, the eggs are in abundance enough so that you can harvest a lot of them and have big pieces of them. So, you know, they're, they're recording really important knowledges and information, these rock engravings, and even just scratching the surface of um, working with community and looking at other historical records and piecing that together. You know, from Sydney here, we're finding this incredibly deep Aboriginal story. Um, and, you know, the, the amazing ways we could actually use apps and other sort of devices to sort of find new ways of presenting this information, I think, is the big challenge for us in a museum. As you can see, there's no shortage of options, even with the most basic stuff. So it's being rigorous and methodical as well is important. <clears throat> this is actually, the, the great thing about the McClay building was, if you've heard of the Garden Palace fire in the, in the Royal Botanic Gardens in the 1880s, it destroyed this huge material assemblage of Aboriginal Sydney. It was the basis of Jonathan Jones' big work that he did in the Botanic Gardens a couple of years ago, where he rebuilt the outline of the Garden Palace. Um, like, there was a few thousand objects that were specific to Sydney. These are like big duck catching nets. Um, just things that we have no other examples to refer to in the historical record. Um, completely burned up in this fire. So the McClay building was actually built in response to the Garden Palace fire and it was built with the most rigorous fireproof standards at the time, in the early 1890s. So, um, it's, a, it's um, to transition from, this is even before the wall arch, so that's the quadrangle, but it's an arch now that connects those two buildings, so this is a very early photograph. Um, to this in the 21st century, this is actually from the spot where the Freedom Riders took off and Charles Perkins led the students for actions on Aborigines. You know, this is the museum will be facing, the entrance will be facing back towards the quadrangle and we'll be able to play with this space in between the two as well. Because the outdoor spaces, especially in Indigenous context, are much more important for us when we do smoking ceremonies or other sort of like cultural experiences. It'd be great to see more graduations happening with Indigenous students and having a really dedicated space where they can do you know, bring Aboriginal philosophies into their graduation process. Um, you know, to be able to use the museum for all sorts of things like that is where it's going to be really interesting too. <coughs> so, a brief teaser, if I have some time. Um, the Maclay Museum is essentially the private collection of the man who established museums in Australia. So. Alexander Maclay came in here as the 1820s as the colonial secretary. His family built Elizabeth Bay House, where the whole museum collection was housed until the 1890s. Uh, three generations of his family sort of contributed to it before he bequested it to the museum. Um, and the thing is, they were entirely, so they were natural history collectors, so they were entirely obsessed with animals and zoology and biology. They collected around 400 objects of Aboriginal manufacture literally because they had pictures of animals on them. So that's how we ended up with some of the oldest bark paintings, uh, the Aboriginal bark paintings of any museum in Australia. Of course, the British Museum has one earlier. The amazing thing with that is though, that's actually from 1840 and it's from Victoria. It's not from the new country where we most often associate um, bark paintings with these days. So that's the importance of getting this information back. You know, we can think that, oh, bark paintings are only from the country in our land. Yet, if, you know, because the actual evidence is held in international museums, we don't realise that bark painting was much more widespread across the country than, we, than it is now. Um, so yeah, we have these nine incredible 1875 Port Essington bark paintings. And there's, there's bits and pieces of the historical record associated with them, but it's actually a challenging consultation tool because 
people we know that made these are the Uwaja people of the Coburg Peninsula. And in this time period, this is even before Darwin was established, um, in the time period since then, the dispossession and the dislocation of Aboriginal people in that particular region has meant that the Uwaja have been absorbed into the larger Larrakia in a lot of contexts. And it's difficult for us to sort of unpack this legacy of all these forced removals and dislocations and pushing together, um, sometimes by doing consultations, we're re-traumatising the community. So there are huge ethical obligations in the way that we actually, um, who we talk to, how we talk to them, what we, um, you know, in a lot of these consultations, sometimes there's nothing to do but just be quiet and listen and apologise because, we have returned through the repatriation project some objects which were picked up after a massacre in the Kimberley region, for example. Um, there's no legal, ethical, moral way you can own objects like that. So even if the object is the most fascinating thing in the world, there's still these moral obligations with a lot of our collections and there's some of the tough discussions that we're having with different community representative bodies, which thankfully are a lot more um, better able to deal with requests from museums these days. I mean, most organisations have health, housing and education priorities up here in museums, way down here, for rightly so. But um, slowly we sort of, through building deeper relationships and sharing much more of our history and resources with these communities, we're sort of changing the relationships and getting different, um, different outcomes, which is the, one of the better things. And actually going full circle. So the thickness is around 1913 when the Nicholson was part of the Buffet Building Museum collection. So this idea of um, how we're merging all our collections for the new museum is not an entirely new thing. It's, the, it's how they actually started. Um, you can see uh, Egyptian figures there. There's Aboriginal spears along the back there. Um, and I think that's really important. What we didn't want to do with the new museum project is have a separate section of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander galleries which people you know, can walk past. We've come up with this through a lot of consultations, this idea that the, the permanent exhibitions of Aboriginal material culture work as ambassadors, so they're objects as ambassadors and the communities that they come from are the embassies. So we're actually connecting the permanent display cases with the communities who are the moral um, authorities regarding how those objects are interpreted and building that into our education program and in a sense sort of um, allowing the community to build their own interpretation of these objects into the way that they're displayed and you know, reconfigured and you know, changed. Every, it's not just set and forget, do it once and walk away, especially with Indigenous content. Things need to be constantly reassessed and reappraised and um, reconsulted on because things change all the time. Not to mention, just to have the space is going to be fantastic. We have another really important bark painting assemblage from 1946-47, which was University of Sydney Research. University of Sydney, as well as the Maclay Bequest, which, we, which goes up until around 1891. The Maclay especially has been incredibly fortunate with bequests from the Anthropology Department, Geology Department. Um, our, Museum collection is a history of the changes of a lot of the faculties over the years as well. You know, the fight for space. <laughs> That's how we actually ended up with some really important objects in our collection. Not to mention the costs associated with conservation associated with a lot of these things too. But for the first time we may be able to reconsider these 118 paintings which were collected in 46, 47. And even now, you know, juxtaposing the different artists and looking at the collection history date, um, it's definitely one of the more exciting projects. It tells a completely different story of the bark paintings than what we had known purely from anthropological records. And you actually know that, like, this is the fun thing we can do with modern technologies. So we had the registration list of the bark paintings, which went from 1 to 118. But then when you resorted that by collection date, it told a completely different story of who were the friendships among the artists and in what order they were talking to Burns. And as you go through the list and the different configuration towards the end of it, the paintings start to become more secret sacred. So they're starting to build this bigger sense of trust. So there's this really amazing 
way that you just reconfigure the assemblage of information with the objects in the same way as we reconfigure the objects and we can tell much um, more community focused versions of those stories which is much more useful than the community rather than you know, curators or anthropologists telling their stories over and over again. The same thing we're doing with our stone tool collection. So when you, we've, we've often applied European typologies to these. So they're scrapers and backdedged and all these terminologies which are not familiar to, well, you know, you can describe the object like that, but they're familiar to European archeologists much more than they have to community members. So when we, because we have thousands of stone tools, like, it's not an underestimate, there's literally tons of stone tools. It's the one thing we have lots of in museums. But when you group them by the language regions in the big language map from across Australia, there's 300 different regions, you actually start to see toolboxes and you start to see just how diverse all the different source materials are that people are actually making Aboriginal stone tools. So you're not just seeing that one axe over and over again, you're actually seeing how the axe is part of the whole toolkit of really interesting objects. Um, so, yeah, keeping with a few really basic objects like that, I think, um, I got to, we actually had this really exciting opportunity to um, present something incredibly new um, and different. You know, the Australian Museum has a completely different collecting philosophy. They do intensely focused research in one particular area, move on to the next. We're really lucky to be beneficiaries of so many benefactors, all the professors, collectors, really dedicated people over the years who um, have, in some ways, it's their life work that they've bequested to the university and it's a real privilege and an honor to be able to sort of, at least witness the process of how these new collections are taking on new life in the 21st century. So I think I'll leave it there and thank you. The question was about um, using language as an object and yeah, how we work with that. Um, it's really interesting because in a lot of, you know, the East Coast of Australia and Sydney was hit first and hit hardest, so it's the most dislocated and language is often the only thing we have to do engagement with Southeastern Australian communities. So, um, you know, the way artists um, title their artworks in language is the same sort of thing. It's, it's just reasserting these names for place. Um, and it's just a way that we can sort of indigenize our museum as well. Like, um, I would much prefer going through the, the word list that we have and just attaching those back to the, the animals and different objects as well. This, this whole, um, as we saw with the astronomy example, this whole um, dictionaries, if not encyclopedias, or ways that we can use this uh, language and reattach it back to object, but I just think it's doing justice to where that object is from. I mean, the Aboriginal name for a lyre bird has been said more times than the non-Indigenous name for it, so it's sort of a restitution act. Um, I haven't really explained that well at all, but it's, it's yeah, we're having fantastic people like uh, Professor Troy to bring a linguistics background which actually solves a lot of the other problems we get when we're just ending up with these endless lists of things that we're trying to attach to objects and it doesn't make sense. Hi, I enjoyed your talk. It's great. Um, I, you mentioned the fact that you're in Chicago too. So a lot of collections uh, of sure, which has got a lot of objects. Um, other than repatriation of maybe or not happen. What way do you want the museum or do you think we should be interacting with those collections? Um, I, this actually comes from library stuff too. It's the idea of virtual reunification. So there's some great examples you can see what the British Museum have done where they, um, <coughs> they've recreated Howard Carter's Tutankhamun did object by object and it doesn't matter which museum in the world is holding which particular object when you're looking at it in a digital environment you can read it the same way as I was describing with the bark painting so you can say oh, I'd like to see the order that he found canoptic jars <laughs> it's, it's this, there's all these really facets of ways of um, yeah reconstructing these assemblages of information because 
when we're working with Indigenous content too, it's just so diverse. You'll be working with something, a photograph, or, or an idea that's represented in a photograph, or you know, when you're talking about evidence, it's coming from everywhere. It's coming from intellectual properties and plants. It's coming from elders. Um, all these sorts of amazing sort of guidelines. But um, yeah, it's really tricky to. to um, describe it in an overall sort of way because everything is on a case-by-case -case basis too. I'd now like to invite uh, Joel Davidson up on the stage. Um, Joel's going to be doing a presentation with Jackie. He's just spreading my for another presentation. Um, Joel is a gay man who's been doing some work around uh, preservation of language. Hi everyone. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I don't have slides prepared for today. Uh, if I'm being entirely honest, I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to talk about, but we're all going to find out together. <laughs> they haven't paid me yet, so you can choose not to after you've heard what I said. Should I a little bit closer? Is that? Yeah, cool. Um, so, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you have heard, I'm a Gadigal and I'm also a Mount man. Um, I've grown up all around Sydney, and uh, I have been involved in the language revitalization process um, for my language, the Gadigal language. Um, so, fair warning, I'm not an academic, I don't have slides, I'm not going to try and be technical, I don't have an extraordinary amount of experience, almost don't know why I'm up here. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's not good. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to keep it at the level that um, you know is best suited to my experience and um, my level of understanding of the language. Um, because I'm not a linguist, I don't have a degree. Um, I've only been doing this for almost three years. Um, so why is it that it's me up here um, telling you about language revitalization of my language? Um, well, uh, I found myself uh, by odd twist, by some odd twist of fate. Um, how many years on? I think 21 years on from my birth and the publication of Jacqueline Troy's The Sydney Aboriginal Language Book um, at the Botanic Gardens teaching culture and heritage and doing tours and talks there. Um, now, I was incredibly passionate about it and I loved it, um, but I'm also incredibly passionate about tech and I love tech. Um, so I left the Botanic Gardens um, to start a career as a software developer, a web and app developer more specifically, um, down at a startup in the IDX, which is the Indigenous Digital Excellence Offices um, at the NCIE, at a startup called NGNY. Um, and just as soon as I thought I was out of the education game, uh, I got I got I got dogged in to Sydney Festival. They pulled me right back in. Um, my old boss at the Botanic Gardens, Jody Orcher, she dug me into Sydney Festival. They were looking for some person to uh, teach Gadigal language. And uh, initially, I was, yeah, I'd love to. But you know I can't speak the language, right? You know, you know this, don't you? But I'd love to. Um, and the reason that I could speak the language, and it's something that had really played on my sense of identity for a long time, is because that's just something that was lost to my family. Still today, I am the only one in my family who has been able to take the time and put the resources and efforts into learning the language. Um, and I'll speak more on this later, but I'm only just to the point now where I have the resources and the knowledge, I feel, to bring the language back to my family at the family scale um, in an effective way. And I'm going to try and do that, and I'll speak more about that later. Um, but I was, I was extraordinarily excited, um, but I told them, you know, uh, it's four months until Sydney Festival. Um, I'm more than happy to be on this project, but you have to understand, I'm only going to be able to teach what I can learn in four months. Um, so in four months, I learned enough to teach a basic class. I learned a bunch of uh, uh, vocabulary and that 
was more or less it. And I was able to tie that a lot into my culture and heritage understanding um, and uh, teach a couple of compelling classes. Um, so that's why I'm here in front of you because uh, there, and if you know anyone, please stand up and tell me I'm wrong. I would love for you to do that. Um, but as far as I know, there are no extraordinary Gadigal speakers who have had the language from birth today till today who are happy to stand up and teach and share and help revitalize the language. Um, and that is just a symptom of the effect that colonialism had on my culture and on my language. Um, and that's why I'm here and not someone better. <laughs> Um, so, that's why am I here, uh, but now I want to go into a little bit about like why I'm here, as in, why am I uh, really going out of my comfort zone, like I said, um, I'm fairly invested in my career in the tech industry, uh, and I'm a programmer, and I'm used to being behind computer screens, I'm not meant to be up on a stage with a microphone in my hand. Um, but why is it important enough for me to go this far out of my comfort zone to contribute to language revitalization? Um, first and foremost, it's an incredibly personal thing. Uh, like I said, um, you know, really played on my sense of identity when I was growing up, uh, being so heavily invested in uh, my people's and my ancestors' culture and contemporary query culture as well. And then having people say, oh yeah, so, do you know how to speak Aboriginal? It's a, bit of, it's a bit of a weird one to ask. It's not just one language. Um, I think the, the running count right now is 700 and growing, or something like that. Um, but if you're asking if I, if I can speak my mom's language specifically, then uh, also no. Um, and that's a little bit rough. Because uh, there's always, you know, it's to no fault of anyone in my family, but it happens to us all the time, you know, you really build up this sense of identity, this sense of connection to the culture, and then um, you don't get intentionally knocked down, but you realize that you will always hit these barriers that are just symptoms of the impact that colonialization had on our people. Um, so it's a incredibly personal thing for me to be able to revitalize the language and bring it back to my family, bring it back to my community, kind of make sure that these barriers that were constructed by um, colonization aren't there anymore for future generations, I hope. Um, and that sort of plays into the second reason why it's so important to me. Um, I'm a very outcomes-driven person. Uh, I'm a very logical and technical person, I think. Um, and for me, I will always do what I feel has the largest impact at the time for my community. And when the Sydney Festival approached me, um, you know, I thought, hey, uh, maybe I'm not the person to be able to do this because I can't speak the language. But this right now presents the best opportunity for me to make the most impact. Um, because there have already been uh, a lot of studies about recently showing that when you give indigenous communities back their language, the language of their people, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, there are a number of beneficial effects uh, with the, associated with the restoration of that cultural identity. And uh, I really, I really enjoy uh, the opportunity to be able to take on that responsibility and be able to um, contribute where I can to that end. Um, now, my motivations, uh, sorry, my aspirations for all of this is of course, first and foremost, I want to learn my own language again. Uh, I want to have that knowledge. When people ask me, oh, do you know how to speak out original? I can be like, ooh, that's a really weird question, but yes, I can, and that's excellent. Um, Second of all, I want to bring that back to my family. I want them to have that same feeling. Going one level higher, I don't want there to be a single person left in Sydney who is convinced that my language is dead. 
I want everyone in Sydney to have the opportunity to learn this language. If they so choose, I want them to be able to learn at school, or to be able to go to a TAFE, or a university, do linguistics, majoring in natural language. That would be incredible. I think that everyone should have that opportunity. And I think it's wild that I had, in high school, I learned Spanish and Italian, and I don't remember any of it. I didn't feel any connection to it whatsoever. Um, Italian totally dragged down my um, HSC scores. I don't even remember what it called. I didn't call it anymore. Um, but because I was just like not connected to Italian. Uh, but I feel like if you have a Sydney based language, you know, suddenly there's all these Sydney norms who are very connected to these classes that they're doing. There's all these Sydney people of all cultures growing up in Sydney, very connected to this language that they're teaching in class. I think that would be something that's incredibly powerful. Going a step beyond that, um, and this is really lame, uh, but I work at Commonwealth Bank now, and for a person like me, it's uh, outside of myself, it's hard to find motivation to work within a large organization like that. Um, but something that really pumps me up and is super lame is the idea of a center of excellence. Uh, and I worked with the Botanic Gardens as a horticulturist before I was an educator, and that is a center of excellence for horticulture. After that, I worked in a startup at the IDX Hub, and that is a center of excellence for indigenous digital excellence. Now, I work in Commonwealth Bank at AROC, which is the Automation Robotics and Operations Central, and that is one of the world's leading centers of excellence for robotics process automation. You can boo me off the stage now. <laughs> Um, and that just so really pumped up. It just really pumped up to know that there are all these resources going into these centers of excellence. And there's all of this experience and all of this cutting edge technology and innovation being developed in these places that are then just going to go out into the open world and benefit almost every single person in that field. And what I would love to see is for Sydney to be turned into a center of excellence for indigenous languages. If this is the spot, that languages started being taken from us. I feel like this is the spot that languages should start becoming excellent again. I would love nothing more, and not just for the Gadigal language, especially not just for the Gadigal language, I would love nothing more for everyone in the country who is doing language great to get together, to share all of their knowledge, to share all of their techniques, bring everyone else up, and then just take it out into the wider country. And not just Australia, take it out into the wider world where there are a lot of indigenous languages that have been similarly impacted by the effects of colonization. Um, so those are my aspirations, however wild they are. Uh, and that's why it's important for me to come out of my shell and be up here and uh, say all the stuff, just pull it out of my head. I haven't written this down anywhere. <laughs> um, and that is what I wanted to share with you today, why language revitalization is incredibly important to me. And I feel like it should be important to all of you as well. I feel like it should be important to um, almost everyone. Um, so, thanks. thanks for listening to me. <laughs>
why is there a misconception between even some of the smartest people when you're just trying to say the easiest thing? Um, so I would say, personally, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. Hi, Joel. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, and what a brilliant aspiration to have this week. Um, just a quick question. I just wondered how you actually did that task of having four months to get across the language to the point of doing something. How did you do that? Um, so I find uh, I'm a habitual learner. Um, I would say my hobby is hobbies, uh, and I find that the best and fastest way to learn is to teach. Um, it's almost it's almost like therapy as well. I mean, yeah, um, the fastest way to learn is to teach. So I, in my spare time, just almost taught a class as well as I could, and just kept up with the content as I went. Um, but beyond that. To get the content to be able to teach, um, I had an incredible amount of help. And you're going to hear a lot from the person that I had an incredible amount of help from because there was no one better to learn from than Sir Jack and Troy, just sitting here in the front row, um, who wrote the book on the Sydney Aboriginal language, published in uh, the year that I was born. Um, and it was just <laughs> perfect. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Mentors. I had another teacher that I was working with, um, Jacinda Tobin, um, and it was really just a lot of face-to-face -face time, um, making sure that what I was learning, I was learning properly, and I had to learn the first time around, and then teaching to really flesh out that knowledge, really cement it, and um, I find that uh, because I'm not great at preparing things, um, when I when I teach. A lot of the peripheral knowledge that I have, all of the cultural heritage knowledge that I have, falls to self into it. So, so teaching and mentors. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in this country. 
there's never been quite that separation for us. You know, the world, the animal world, the, um, the environment, the plant world, the indeed every rock, every every piece of earth, every part of the country has um, deep meaning for all of us. We are the country owns us. Um, I'm sure that Joel was um, talking about this as I walked in. This sort of great ongoing connection that people have and. Through our languages, of course, that's how we talk about our um, connection to country. And without our languages, it becomes very, very difficult to um, easily be the people that we can be, that we are, that we should be. Um, I, I often say to people, if as of tomorrow I said to you, you can no longer speak whatever your mother tongue is, and one way or another, everybody in this country is forced to speak English, so let's just say, you can't speak English at all. Everybody in the country has to stop speaking English. Um, that is an amazing, you know, that's if you really did drill down to what that would feel like, um, that's what it's been like for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. You'd be reduced to people who can say nothing. Even the smallest baby would probably have um, a, a better chance of communicating with another human because babies have got a whole repertoire that they um, tragically interrupt by becoming verbal. Um, and discover, you know, to develop any oral languages that we use. And, um, you know, just to get through an average day in um, the Sydney area before 1788, and, and for some time afterwards, people would be operating in up to nine languages just to, just to get through a normal day. So you would speak child language, and these are separate languages. They're not dialects of the language. These are separate languages that we have child language, so within any language group like Animal, you have child language, there'd be secret men's um, business language, so the language that men would use when they're sharing and handing on knowledge, secret women's um, language, so when women are handing on knowledge to other women, they would be sharing that in, 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 in a secret women's language that technically men don't understand. Um, uh, Mother-in-law language, that's what I often say to people, I really would like that um, uh, it's, um, it's a very special language um, style that you see across Australia where mothers-in-law and sons-in-law are allowed to talk directly to each other. Um, that's a good thing. But, um, and so a mother-in-law would say to somebody um, who knows this language, you know, um, tell that boy over there, whatever, and um, then he would respond with, tell that old woman over there. Uh, but an old woman is actually a term of respect, um, which I embrace as I can call <laughs> So, and then they would have a dialogue that would go between them, but never actually ever having to face up to each other. Many avoidance kind of relationships in Aboriginal Australia too. We avoid um, cousins of particular relationships. Um, you'll often hear Aboriginal people telling their kids, um, I even had this discussion with slaves and people about you know, no, you can't talk to him as your cousin and don't get too close to him or her as your cousin. So we're very careful about um, social relationships. Um, then we had um, sign languages as well. So people who um, use sign languages, women particularly all over Australia use sign languages. And it's not because people are hearing impaired or deaf. Of course, there are those languages as well. But there are languages that people use to just keep people out of that conversation. So women would sign so that children didn't understand them, for example. Kids running around all the time around you want to be a bit private, women sharing knowledge, sharing information. So we had this sort of rich um, linguistic repertoire that um, we were able to um, use on a daily basis. And then of course we knew everybody around us, we knew their languages. So the Gadigal mob, um, in the Sydney basin there was probably one language, it looks like there was. But when you go out to the Hawke's Green and beyond, um, there's another language, Gunungara and uh, Gundungara. And um, but before you get into Gundungara country, it looks like there was a dialect of this city basin language, which is Joel's language. And um, one of the things that characterises it is it has this mm sound in the middle of the word. So um, at the coast here, your foot would be Manui, and over the Hawke's Green would be Mandui. So um, there are all sort of little you know, sound differences that um, characterise this other dialect. And then you move up into Gunungara country. You sometimes hear people talk about Gunungara, which tells me that that's probably somebody who's come from a more coastal tradition and they're thinking of these people without that and stop in the middle. 
groups. So, so people knew each other's languages, you know, women usually came from other groups, from other language groups, with all nine or more of their daily language files as well. So you can imagine, you can imagine what a loss was to, um, well, it's a loss to all of us when, when that stopped. Um, fortunately, it never completely stopped. The Aboriginal people in the Sydney area kept their language going to a degree. There is still community knowledge. Um, there's also this wonderful set of manuscripts that, and there's people with an interest in libraries and collections who would um, understand the value of keeping um, extremely rare documents. Sometimes they look ephemeral, but who knows what they're going to be useful for into the future. And so as Joel said, I had the opportunity to work with his language from a set of little notebooks. They're like those little moleskin notebooks. They actually are late 18th century moleskin notebooks that are held in the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. They've been known as the Dawes Manuscripts because there was a very brilliant young man, William Dawes, who was on the First Fleet. He was a protege of Sir Joseph Banks. He spoke probably 12 languages. He was in his early 20s. He's like Joel, had a obviously a, a great passion for languages and communicating and a, a very good memory and um, I'm sure if he was around today you, you might be developing these virtual reality apps and things that you're so interested in. So um, William Dawes uh, made great friends with a young woman called Bajigara um, in particular who was probably in her mid-teens and had the freedom to still sort of come and go and be someone who could be an interlocutor between the non-Aboriginal people and the um, Aboriginal people of Sydney. And she was teaching his, her, him her language at the same time as um, he was teaching her English. She was really interested in his language. As I just said, you can imagine if you operate with nine languages every day just because that's what you do, another language coming in and something as different as English would have been really interesting. Um, I now call those books, notebooks, the Bajigarang manuscripts because actually it's her words, it's her language that's in there her language and the language of other women in particular, Burong is another woman, um, they all appear in this um, set of notebooks and there's all these wonderful lively discussions between William Dawes and Bajigarang where she says things to him like he will tell her, um, put your clothes on, you're standing in front of the fire, you know, like and there's people around, you know. Um, and he, she's like, why would I put my clothes on? I I want the heat on my body, not on something, you know, around, because of course everyone is encouraged to wear clothing, you know, a great way to get pneumonia if you're not used to wearing clothing. And um, so there's these really funny kind of interchanges. There's um, one time they're walking along the beach and um, he, um, he's, he's finding the, gl the glare off the beach is unbearable. And so she teaches him that that's Mari Gana Ningamai, which is um, very heated eyes, so that burning off the sand. But the word, that same word, Gana Ninga, is also the word to copulate. So it's sort of kind of like my eyes are fucked. Sorry, <laughs> technical language I'm using here. So it's exactly what you can imagine a couple of young people walking along a beach, God, you know. and, um, and then other, you know, really beautiful moments we um, at Sydney University are beginning to use your language, Joel, to um, not only to honour your people, but also to be part of your people, to, to understand what it is to be on Gadigal country. So, and kindly, you know, you're sharing that um, capacity with us as well. And there's a, an initiative called Budawa that I believe the Indigenous Strategy and Services area are developing. And that comes from a word that um, Bajigarang shared with William Dawes as well, where it's to warm your hands in front of a fire and then to hold someone else's hands in your hands and warm their hands. So it's that kind of, you know, sensitive, caring, um, engage, human engaged sort of emotion in one word. Um, in English we have to say something a lot longer to say this thing that's just Buddha. And um, so many other things. She, she, he asked her one day, why are that yura afraid? So that word iora that you often hear, and people are the aurora nation, and that's a really good way to describe the people of this area because iora or yura, as it prob probably was in 1788, um, was the word for people, Aboriginal people, um, and 
he asked her, why are the Yuras afraid? And she said, because of the guns, Guribra, because of the guns. And this is, there's this, and that word is about the fire stick, you know, so when they shot their muskets um, at people, um, there was a blast of fire, because that's the kind of guns they had that sort of had this explosive smoke and fire, you know, the flints hit, you know, and um, so you can imagine the impact of um, that kind of technology on a people who were um, not into killing other people. You know, if there was a, a fight in this area, it was much more of a ritualised event. And the language reflects that. People are respectful of each other. We're not, we are like all human beings. All Aboriginal people are like all human beings. We have our disputes, but we resolve them without having to take people's lives unnecessarily. Um, very different to the British, unfortunately, who um, were about summary justice. And the people in this area, I was only reflecting, um, last night I was doing a piece with um, the Barangaroo um, area about what, who Barangaroo was, you know, this wonderful, strong woman who was a fishing woman um, that now we have this area named after. And um, I was thinking about um, the way in which she um, and other women and, and the men in the Sydney area cared for the people who came into this country. Didn't just share their language, but also shared food. You know, they looked after, we look after people. We don't stand by and watch them die. The British, on the other hand, what did they do? On one of the favorite little picnic spots, if you like, that's how it's described in the First Fleet Diaries, picnic spots out on the harbor, which is where um, Pinchgut is now, the little Fort Denison place, which is, a very creepy little spot, you know, designed to repel the French and the Russians, and, um, and it was also a prison, because you put people into a cold, damp cell below the waterline, you know. Um, but before that was happening, before that area was levelled, um, the British were putting people out there on that island who committed crimes that were serious enough for them to be executed, and they were hung in chains. So living human beings were hung on racks, alive in chains to die and to be picked apart by the birds, which are part of the cosmology, the ecology, the totemic world of Aboriginal people in Sydney. So you can imagine what the, I can't even begin to imagine what your mob thought of that, Joel. You know, it's, um, so, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't do that kind of thing in Aboriginal Australia. We still don't. Um, it's probably one of the reasons why our sovereignty is not recognised because we just didn't um, we didn't challenge other people's right to live and to be. We, you know, you come into our country, but at some point you're meant to go, <laughs> and nobody left, and you know that's that's okay now. But um, it's a it's a, a you know it's an ongoing problem for Aboriginal people in Australia, and this loss of our languages as part of that invasion of our countries has been. Um, has had a really profound impact. Um, I love Joel's idea, I've been pushing for this at Sydney, to have um, this is a place where we particularly work with the Sydney mob on reviving the languages of this area. You know, the, the mob at La Perouse have now got a program to um, get their language Tharawal, because um, the, there's a South Coast language, of course, that starts down towards Botany Bay. Um, some people are now saying it actually came up a bit further. Um, I'm not surprised to hear this. Um, certainly we get along with each other as Aboriginal peoples, but we've, we've always had our disputes. And there are, we have these what we call dispute areas and fuzzy borders. Um, Sydney's bounded by rivers. I just heard your grandfather once again saying the beautiful Hawkesbury, the Nepean, the Cooks, the Georges kind of bound the Sydney basin and create this space for the language and the people and all the clan groups within that area. But of course people were always, you know, toing and froing and pushing the boundaries a bit. Um, I haven't said who I am, my own country. I'm Ngaya Nyamajimitong. I am of the Nyamaj clan, of the Narugu people, of the Snowy Mountains. We're high country Aboriginal people, the only Alpine Aboriginal people in Australia. And um, we've got the, the Wiradjuri, the Ngunnawal, and then the Wiradjuri on, on, on one of our sort of lower, not technically a boundary because our mountains sort of go like that, you know, so, um, and my core country is up near Kyandra, Lobs Hole, um, 
and um, it drops down about 800 metres into this valley called Lobs Hole. The ravine is actually, um, for those of you who like Australian literature, Rolf Boulderwood wrote about my country in Robbery Under Arms. It's the valley, the ravine. And my language, um, I'm beginning to get a little bit of it back. And some of what Joel and I have been doing is helping me to um, learn about my own language because they belong to the same family, the Palmanuan family of languages. Um, things like pronoun forms are the same, body parts, all these kinds of, we share a whole lot of core vocabulary and grammatical structures, but it's the local, the local vocabulary that's really different. Obviously the way they talk about the plants, the animals, the ceremonies, the, the artifacts, all those kinds of things are very different here to where they, what they are in my country, in the snow country. Um, but uh, the Wiradjuri are a huge, huge group of people in central New South Wales, probably the biggest nation next to the Gamilaroi, who are a bit further north. Um, and, you know, they are, I heard young Stan Grant say recently to me, well, we're kind of the colonisers of Aboriginal New South Wales. And I, it was a bit tongue in cheek, but they have certainly got a very big territory. Um, so, you know, um, I think that we, we were never people who were static, and why would we be? You know, we push boundaries, we share culture. Or, so, um, yeah, so we, you know, we are people who um, share language knowledge as well. Um, Joel and I were um, thinking also of um, sharing some actual language with you. Um, I'm wondering if Joel, you want to, I'm sorry, this is a bit organic. Um, and if, you're in, if you enjoy hearing about the language of the Sydney area, I'm sure we'd be um, very pleased to set up some proper language classes. So back to your vision, Joel, of Sydney University being a centre of excellence for language revival, language maintenance, language practice. This university belongs to every Aboriginal person in Australia, just as it belongs to every person in this room. Not only because you work here, it's a public institution. This is a, a knowledge powerhouse. This is a place where why isn't it a place where 65,000 years of Aboriginal knowledge and knowledge development and language knowledge isn't um, celebrated and core to this place? It doesn't have to be in one spot. It should be in every faculty, in every department. And I'm really delighted that the library is interested in engaging with this language. And I know that Joel, Joel's language classes for the Sydney Festival were um, oversubscribed and everybody who did them came out of it um, just wanting more and wanting to know more. So if this university, um, I'm going to be very bold in saying this, if this university wants to run a series of language classes, I'm only too happy to support Joel and Jacinta if she's available and any other um, Sydney Mod person, um, but particularly Joel because he's really He's not only beginning to speak his language again, he's beginning to use it in the most amazing modern technological way. Last night I looked at, did you talk about the Indigitech? So um, Joel um, was presenting last night at Indigitech on a virtual reality environment that tells story in language and you can, you know, you'll be able to put on your virtual reality headset and go on a journey, a kind of gamer journey, um, but a, one, a, a cultural journey to, um, you know, understand something of this environment and its stories and its history with some of the most beautiful graphics I've seen in a long time where young Sydney mob people, Gadigal and others, um, are imagining what it is to be a young Aboriginal person in this environment and thinking into their own future while reflecting on the past and presenting it in this very, very modern way that actually we can all engage with. Um, so that, um, I guess, would be my shout out to this group. Um, if you want more, we can do it. Yeah, Joel? Yeah, he's nodding, he's not glaring at me, so. <laughs> right, okay. So. So, uh, I don't have slides, sorry. I don't have slides uh, prepared but I will be able to prepare them in like three minutes. Do you have anything else to fill in that time? Sure, so I guess um, while Joel's um, having a, I love this story, he's so quick with this technology, but um, do people have any questions, comments, anything that you'd like to um, challenge me on? Um, 
add to what I'm saying? Um, suggestions? Yeah. Did I say I'm the director for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research? By the way, I sit in. You did all that, and I, so I sit in Duncan's portfolio. Uh, thanks so much. Really, really interesting. So I um, come from originally the University of Newcastle, and they have uh, a team there built a Duncan John dictionary for yeah, um, yeah. the country up there. Ray Kelly. And um, <laughs> I can kind of understand where how how you pull together vocabulary, but how do you get grammar? <laughs> you know, it must be so difficult. Well, um, so our language is a polysynthetic, which means that um, there is very little that just sits like um, in English you'd say, oh, this is a word, you know, apple, it's a word, um, uh, run, it's a word, and it's got some grammatical marking on it, particularly for verbs, but um, ran, run, um, running, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, our language is you start with a verb, what we loosely call a verb stem, and then you add something onto that verb stem. I should have said too, we've got about 407 languages now identified in Australia and, and rising, and out of those languages there are only 13 that are still spoken right through for all purposes across all generations every day. About another 150 that are still spoken by some people, and then others like my own language and Joel's, which are in this early revival mode, if you like. Um, so how do I do it? So I got the William Dawes, the Pudgigarung manuscripts, and I'm training myself. And fortunately, because Dawes um, was a language scholar, he wrote down what he knew about the language of Sydney using verb paradigms based on ancient Greek which is also a polysynthetic language, which means you've got a stem and then you add, it's like coding, it is coding, it's, um, you add onto the stem information about who did what to who, where and when and how. So, um, so um, have you got some of your <laughs> examples here? So I could say, um, uh, na jia wa, na to see, jia past tense, wa. I. And then if I wanted to add a free pronoun to make it emphatically, I saw, naya na jawa, you know, something like that. So the verb na never sits by itself. It always has all this other information added onto it. Um, so because he, in, in, in every piece of manuscript about any Australian language, when you get a word, it's actually a, it's actually a, a whole something, a whole utterance, I'll say a whole sentence we might say in English. So it's, it's very rarely will it be just one little bit of, you know, like apple, <laughs> that's an apple. Um, so um, as a linguist, I can look through the patterns in this text and um, predict from what we know about the languages that are still spoken right through and the better documented languages in the southeast, from, in my case, like Niampa in Western New South Wales was very well documented the community out there, the Kennedy family particularly, um, recorded a lot of information, spoken information, so I can hear the sounds, the sounds of that language, the sounds of Wiradjuri. Wiradjuri is a very well um, documented language. Dakanyong, um, Dangari, is North Coast, Banjalang, Gumbangi. We've got a lot of languages in New South Wales that are still, they were sort of caught with at the moment when people still were speaking the languages, so I could you listen to the sounds of those languages and then you can predict what these texts um, will tell you about how the language sounded. And then you figure out what are the smallest units of sound with meaning. And then you figure out what are the smallest um, units of sounds that come together to make what we call morphemes. So we look for a phoneme, which is the smallest unit of sound with meaning. And then the, phone, the morpheme is the smallest group of sounds that make um, if you like, an idea. So that's the basis for working out a grammar. Um, I'm happy, as I said, to, um, if people want to drill down into more of what is it to revive a language, I'm very happy to do um, something specific about that. And even using our library collections, we've got Elkins material and other material in the collections that I'd be very happy. I could, I'm happy to show how I reconstructed the language of Sydney using my own um, manuscripts. So. He's a, isn't he a genius? This is 65,000 years of distilled intelligence. <laughs> um, so I'm 
unfortunately I am going to be a little bit rude. Um, I'm going for my pigs test and I'm going to leave in uh, seven minutes. See you in a little in seven minutes. <laughs> um, so as Jacqueline touched on, um, a lot of the sentence, a lot of the grammar uh, revolves around expressing what in conclusion we would usually express in sentences in one word by attaching context to a root verb. Um, and there are other things that you can attach suffixes to, but we're going to focus on verbs because that's how you form most of most sentences. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of a call and receive, um, and the longer that um, you will take the call out, the later I am for my piece test. Um, so let's, let's get right to it. So I'm going to teach you a little sentence around speaking. Um, so the root verb for speak is na na. So na na. Na na. Perfect. And if you wanted to say let's speak by um, attaching an imperative to na na, it would be na na la. Or it's one word, na na la. Perfect. Um, so the easiest way to start a sentence is by attaching ownership um, by using pronouns. And as Jacqueline said, in English, um, we are used to only having the free form of words. We don't have bound forms because we don't add words onto other words to give context in the way that um, agglutinative languages do. Uh, so usually I go through this whole list and make sure everyone's got down pat, but we're just going to focus on I and, uh, I and you today. So the, the free form of I is Naya. Naya. And the free form of you is, um, yeah, it's Nini. It's a Nini. And the bound form of I is Wa. Wa. And that is exactly the same as Naya, but you must attach it to a verb. Um, so the bound form of you, which is a little bit confusing, is Ni because the free form for me in English is me, but yeah, in our language it's a little bit different. Um, so you can start to say, um, you can start to make very simple sentences just by attaching ownership onto verbs. So if you wanted to say, I am speaking, you can say, I am. Yeah, perfect, I am. Um, and it gets a little bit more complicated um, with attaching pronouns, and usually it takes us about um, an hour in our classes just to get this part right because I get confused all the time. <laughs> but you can also, and also that's especially because I'm not a linguist, so call me up if I think. Um, but you can also attach on a subject for the verb. And um, it's worth noting that when you have the free forms of words in a sentence in general language, it is a free sentence structure. You can usually glean the context just because a lot of the context is added on verbs usually, but if you want to use the free forms, um, you can do it anyway. But if you start using bound forms to create context, they need to be added in a certain order. So first you have the root verb, oh, I'll well, bring one. <laughs> um, then you have who is performing the action, so by our one, as we all said, is I am speaking, and then you have the subject. So if I wanted to say, I am speaking to you, I'd say, by our one. By our one. Perfect. Yeah, really. You guys are picking up like crazy games, should do all my classes in seven minutes. <laughs> um, so you can attach a little bit more uh, context, uh, like tense. Um, when I'm doing these slides, I can include the free form. Um, so you'll just have to believe me that they exist. <laughs> um, but if you wanted to indicate that something is the present, you do not add anything onto it. If you want to indicate something is in the past, use ja, so ja. ja. And something future is ba, ba. And that gets attached to the word before the pronouns. Um, so if I wanted to say that um, I I was speaking to you, or I did speak to you in the past, um, you would say, Baya, Ja, Wa, Me. 
by a child mom. Yeah, you might see it looks it looks big and scary. Um, actually, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it looks it looks big and scary. Um, but once you start to identify which part of the word is or means what in terms of like the context, you can start to break it down into um, I forgot the word the word that means how many syllables. Yes, you can break it down into syllables because it's a lot easier to say. Um, so we can have a little bit more onto this. Um, I did say just a moment ago that when you have the three form of words in a sentence in category language, you can put them in any order that you want. That is true up until you add negators. And negators always have to go on the end of sentences. Um, so the free form of the negator is beav, so beav, yeah. and that means no, or didn't, or wasn't, or it's just a general negator. Um, and the bound form of that is boogie, so boogie. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, you can see here, um, if you, oh, sorry. Yeah, the negator is on the front of sentences, not the end of sentences. Forgive me. Um, so saying biao bayan is um, correct, but you cannot say bayan mi biao um, just because of how the negator adds context onto free forming sentence structures. Um, it's, yeah, I think we chose to do it that way to make sure that things don't get lost. Um, as often in uh, in speech as it does in English. So if we wanted to say um, I won't speak to you in the future because I'm never invite you here again, <laughs> you could say um, Baya, Baya, Ba, ba Wa, ba, Mi, mi buni. buni. So let's just go Baya Ba, Baya Ba, Baya ba, ba, ba.